Before we start, we need to re review what the symbols mean. This means I form, you, he, she, it, we, y'all, they. The forward-looking head it means forward-looking or prospective into the f future. Backward-looking head is backward-looking or retrospective into the past. Also, the passive form as we know now. I am blanked, you are blanked, he, she, it is blanked, we are blanked, y'all are blanked, and they are blanked. All right, so in English and Latin, there are two different situations based on whether the main verb in the sentence is past tense or present tense. So the first situation is that the main verb is either present or future tense, like I hope that you or I will hope that you as our main verb. In Latin, this would be petebo ut or peto ut. Now if that's the case, then the subjunctive verb will have be some form of shall, will, can, may. Either shall, will, can, may itself if it's forward looking or shall, will, can, of may have if it's backward looking. Now the second situation that can occur is when we have a past tense main verb. This could be any of the three past tenses that you know already. Perfect, like I hoped that you, Pluperfect, like I had hoped that you, and imperfect, like I was hoping that you. And there's your Latin forms. If the main verb is any of these three, then the subjunctive will be should, would, could, might, or should have, would have, could have, might have, based on whether we want to talk about looking forward to a future possibility or backward to a past possibility of what might have happened. Again, here too, this also follows the relative time rule. So the time when the subjunctive occurred is relative to the time when the main verb occurred. Recall the translation chart. Well, there are two different situations that we covered in previous slides. And notice that in each of these situations, we could have to use a present stem or a perfect stem. Notice that. So there's no quick, easy solution to rule out certain possibilities. So what we're going to learn in future slides of this video is that if we've got a past tense main verb talking about some event way back in the past, then we're going to use perfect stem plus an adulteration or mess up of the form of to be, esse, plus our ending. So here's what they all look like. So here they all are, and you can see that they're pretty well symmetric. Each situation has two arrows coming into it. Okay, so let's talk a moment about what you should hear in your ear and then think when you hear each of these subjunctive words. If you hear something that sounds like an infinitive, like woko wise or wokare, that signifies abstract reality. Abstract is something that is otherworldly, theoretical, divorced from reality has no flesh and bones on it, but it's just like an idea. That's abstract. The infinitive is an abstract action treated as a noun. You're concretizing it and viewing it as a noun abstractly, like calling itself, the act of calling itself. And so it's natural when we hear an infinitive in our ear that we should naturally think, oh, should, would, could, might, because should, would, could, might is also an abstract theoretical reality. So infinitives like the action of calling or the state of having called naturally are conducive to this idea of shouldness, wouldness, couldness, or mightness. However, if we hear some form of future like this E or A, which is very similar to your third and fourth conjugation A and E rule, if you forgot that, like decom, decase, decet, or is erim, which is similar to ero, eris, erit, the form of the verb to be in, the, in its future tense, then that is not abstract. That more suggests possibility and freedom and potentiality. Why does it do this? Well, the reason it does it is because in wokem, by changing that vowel to its opposite of what you would expect, it gives this idea of freedom that, hey, I can break the rules or I'm being different and unique. And that difference and unique should and make you realize that, oh, this is a subjunctive verb, a, a possibility, a hypothetical 
thing that might happen, not something that certainly will happen. The Wokal Warim doesn't signify freedom quite as much. That's just because this tense is so close to the future perfect that it really kind of gets swallowed up and absorbed by the future perfect and is hardly even a subjunctive tense at all. Now that we have four tenses of the subjunctive, how do you decide which one you should use? What's the actual thought process to make that decision? So what is the chain of thought that you should follow as you're deciding which of these four subjunctive tenses to make when you want to write a sentence? Well, remember, the first decision is up here in the top row. Is my main, main verb a present or be later than that tense? Or is my main verb a past tense? So based on that, you'll either go to the left with past tense or to the right with present or future. After that, once you've noticed what your main verb is, then you'll pick from one of the two possibilities. On the right here, if you've got a present main verb, then it will be wokawarim or wokem, depending if you want to be looking to the future or to the past. Over here on the left, you'll pick from one of these two verbs, wokarim or wokawisim. And you can see that you can use any of the four subjunctive words, whichever one you, pl you please. Should, would, might, could, it doesn't matter. This brings in the second way, the second and easier way to think about it. You think to yourself, okay, does it feel past-ish or does it feel present-future-ish? Once you decide that, then you say ut, which means so that. And then you just have to know by experience what two subjunctives go with the past main verb and which one of them is the apostrophe ve one and which two subjunctives go with the present future-ish main verb and which one is the apostrophe ve one. Obviously the perfect stem ones are the apostrophe ve ones, but you have to actually just know them and be able to rattle them off. And you can think about it in English like this. I blanked so that I might blank or might have blanked. And then in the right side, I blank so that I may blank or may have blanked. blanked. All right, try to answer these questions. As you answer these, pay particular attention to what tense the main verb is in, because that will tell you which of the two situations you're in. All right, so stop the video and then you can start it to see the answers. All right, there they are. And then attempt these as well, which are very similar. Notice too that ne down here is just the negative form of ut. So if ut is so that, ne then would be so that not. Or our English way of saying that is lest. All right, so now you have a good grasp of the concept of the subjunctive. Now we just need to get really good at writing these subjunctives, and that's what we're going to do in this next part of the video. Now we are on to our fourth subjunctive tense, the past backward looking, or the old traditional name for it was the pluperfect subjunctive, which I think is really misleading. So, in any case, the way you make this one is you use the perfect infinitive to have blanked, woka with se, and you add on an ending. Okay, so what is that perfect infinitive? In case you forgot, you take the third principle, you take the perfect stem, will kav, and add on an adulterated form of esse, which became isse. But it really is esse, but it just is said like isse. And that means to be in a state of having blank, having called, having blanked. So to have called, to have laughed, to have run, and to have heard. All right, and on to this, we add our ending. What then do the parts of this really mean when you hear them? What should you think? Well, the T means doing. He is doing it. She is doing it. The S means doing the being of something. And then the Kukuri means not now, but back then. So put it all together and you get doing being, as it were, in a reported state or in a historical state. And this essa here is an infinitive, which 
conveys an idea of abstractness. And hopefully you know by, know by now that abstractness is when you take something and tear away from it with your mind down to its base, essential, bare structure or definition. That's abstracting. And so we can do that and come up with a concept. And that's basically what you're doing with these past backward looking subjunctive. You're taking an action and stripping it down to just the concept of doing that action. He was just doing the concept of it. So that's where we're, where we're going to get our translation should have. He should, in this imaginary reported state, have run. He should have run. And notice again that I took this essa and put it in an off-color faded orange to remind you that this action is not real like solid orange over here, but abstract. I might have laughed, you might have laughed, he might have laughed, we might have laughed, y'all might have laughed, they might have laughed. Okay, once again then the hard part will be the passives, but this one will be easier because we don't have a weird sim to deal with on this one. This one will follow exactly what you would expect it to do. Alright, so just a brief review again. Um, these perfect stem endings make their active using the third principal part, will kav, whereas in their passive they use the fourth, and that appears like this in the passive. You know, it's a separate word, so that's why I use a balloon, because there's a separation there between the wokatis and the ero. It's not like the wokatis is leaning against ero in the very same word. So wokatis ero. So that's how you make the passives up there. And then we're going to do the exact same thing to make our past backward looking subjunctive. So for this one I'm going to compare the past backward looking subjunctive to the pluperfect. So wokawaram and wokawisem are not very similar. Pluperfect uses eram with the participle, whereas this new subjunctive that we're learning today is going to use sm plus the participle. Now what is sm? Do you remember? Hopefully you remember back from slide 40 that this green color is the present infinitive to be plus an ending. So, essa is just your infinitive of sum. So it goes sum essa thui. And that combines with the participle like this. Um, notice also that we only have nominative endings here because the doer of the verb is always a nominative. It is never dative or accusative or anything like that. All right, so I had been called, it's pluperfect, but I would have, might have, should have, or could have been called would be past backward looking subjunctive. All right. And you could have hopefully guessed that if you had been following the pattern of may, may have, might, now it's might have. So you could hopefully follow the pattern of all our four subjunctive tenses that they went will, will have, would, what comes next, would have. All right, so we're obviously focused on this tense here. And the pluperfect therefore went wokawaram wokatus eram in its passives, making it I had been called, you had been called, she had been called, we had been called, y'all had been called, they had been called, whereas... the past backward looking subjunctive is going to tack on sm. Ism is a form of it. Making it be wokatus esm, wokatus esses, wokatus esset, wokati esemus, wokati esetes, wokati esset. They might have been called. Okay, let's ham it up. And hopefully you notice that changed halfway through when we switched into plurals. And to include the other genders, you could have those too, but they're always nominative, never dative, accusative, or ablative, or genitive. And that gives us the translation should have been called. All right, so stop the video and attempt these questions. Hopefully you're in the habit of doing these and I can predict what their answers will be by now. 
And then also do the next slide. And notice on the first question on the next slide, there are actually two past backward looking subjunctives that you have to do, not just one. Okay, so stop the video and start it when you're ready to see the answers. On this one, notice fuiscent. That is your verb of to be in this past backward-looking subjunctive. So get in the habit of recognizing that, because that is an easy thing to take note of. Same with SM. That is the past forward-looking form of it. So get in the habit of noticing them. All right, so bringing it all together. So we have our four subjunctive tenses. We've got active on the top and passive on the bottom. And so the actives, again, were Ben read a diary, and Wokav erim, and then Wokarim, and Wokawisim, and then down in the passives it will be be blanked of whatever was in the active. So may have called becomes may have been called, would call becomes would be called, and would have called becomes would have been called. And the ways you make these are in the present forward looking. You just tack on the aris tur mermini inter endings. Same over here in the third one, the past forward looking, just aris tur mermini inter endings. But to make the passive of the other two, you need, since it's a perfect stem tense, you need to use the participle to make the passive. And so one will get sim, and the other will get sm. So sim was the subjunctive of sum, maybe, and the other gets sm, might be. You might think of sim as a subjunctive of sum, and it is, but it's bigger than that. So, because it could also include future. It's kind of the subjunctive also of ero. Same with SM, you might think of it as the subjunctive of eram, and most teachers will tell you that. They will say, oh, this is the imperfect subjunctive, and so it is the subjunctive of the imperfect indicative, which was eram. But the answer you should say to them is, well, it's bigger than that, because SM is a subjunctive not just of eram, but also of phooey. So when they say that to you, shout, phooey, phooey. That's just fui in the subjunctive, not just eram. Okay, so, haha, funny, funny. And then they'll say back to you, oh no, but fui is perfect, and the perfect subjunctive of fui is fuerim. And then you should say back to them, oh, but fui meant something happening in the past, whereas fuerim could mean something happening in the present or future. So how are those two the same? Or fui is translated half blanked, whereas fuerim is translated will ha have blanked. So how are will or shall or may futurishly have blanked? So how are those two the same? That's just if you want to do your little part to change the old way of doing things to a new, more proper way of thinking about these. There really is no comparison between the four subjunctive tenses and the six indicative tenses. The six indicative tenses are rigid, are at certain points on the timeline, and the four subjunctive tenses are at certain other points on the timeline, and they move, whereas the six indicatives don't really move. Okay. Alrighty. So bringing it all together, hopefully this slide should make a lot more sense to you now. May call. May have called might call, or would call, would have called. Put them all together and they look like a mess, but we can organize them a little more nicely. Notice that each one has a come in and then a go out, and a come in and a go out. And then in the passives, may be called, may have been called, might be called or would be called, and then 
would have been called. Put them together and they make a mess, but they can be organized. And notice that the orange spheres have orange stems and the green spheres have green stems. So get these things straight in your mind. You might have to stop the video and to really get your full phantasm view of this so that you can remember it. All right, and then the last thing in this part of the video is irregular verbs. The verb to be and the verb to go. And these do not have a passive because you can't say I was bead or I was gone. No, no, no. So they only have active. And we have the principal parts of go down at the bottom here now. In our four tenses, these are going to follow the expected patterns except in the present forward looking subjunctive. So there, sum becomes sim and eo is it imus it is eunt becomes eam, eas, eat, eamus, eatus, eant. We shall go. And these two are irregular, just in this subjunctive tense only. The others follow the rules. Perfect stem plus form of erim. Present infinitive plus ending. Perfect infinitive plus ending. And the translations are exactly what you would expect. So, tense review. Where in the timeline do each of these occur? Hopefully you can do these now. If you don't want me to tell you, then press M on your keyboard to mute it so you don't hear what I say. But the way it is is present backward looking, present forward looking, past forward looking, present forward looking, present forward looking, past forward looking, present backward looking, past forward looking, present backward looking, present forward looking. Oh yes, and this is a form of the verb to want. Wo lo, I want, becomes well lim. I may well shall can want. It's a nicer way to say it than just to say, I want it. Well lem is I would want, I might want. It's a nicer way to say it. I w would have is past backward looking. Present backward looking, past backward looking, past backward looking. Potvoisem, past backward looking, I might have been able. Past backward looking, I might have wanted. Present backward looking, I might, may have want, may have gone. Present forward looking, I, past forward looking, and that's them all. So see if you can do it now without colors. Good luck. Stop the video and start it again when you want to see the answers. All right, so now you know all the forms of the subjunctive tenses. All that is left is to figure out how to use them in sentences, and that's going to be the third and final portion of this subjunctives video. This is the third and final part of the subjunctives video, and in this we're going to bring it all together and figure out exactly how to use subjunctives in sentences. And there are about seven or eight different kinds of subjunctive clauses, which will take a subjunctive, and we are going to learn them now. Our last and final subjunctive construction is going to be called a conditional sentence. A conditional sentence has two clauses. One is called the conditional clause, also called the protasis, or in logic class, they might call it the hypothesis or the if statement. And the rest is going to be the main clause, which is also called the apodesis, or in logic class, the conclusion or the then statement. And the if and the then are going to be riveted to their clause. They never separate from their clause. So sometimes they may flip places, but the if and then will flip places also, just like this. If you cook, then I will eat. 
can flip places to I will eat if you cook. See how that happened? And notice this one on the right is still the protasis, and that one on the left is still the apotasis. So you can encounter conditional sentences in either format. All right, what about the verb itself? Well, there are three possible patterns it can have. It can be if indicative, then indicative, which you can translate already since it doesn't even involve a subjunctive. However, you might have the, for the if statement be a subjunctive, or you might have both the if and then statements be a subjunctive. And each one of these is going to be translated in a different way. Um, the first one is just like normal. You've been doing it all along. The second one is also like normal, where you're just going to use your SHWC or M words for the subjunctive. And then you'll just translate the indicative like a normal indicative. So, you know, you can expect that. But this last one here is weird, and it's almost always going to be the SH form, then the W form. If should, then would, or if shall, then will. All right, so a general warning. Avoid other textbooks and grammar's instructions on how to translate conditional sentences. They are wrong and confusing, and they will label different kinds of conditional sentences as Oh, well, this is a contrary to fact conditional sentence. And this is a future less vivid conditional sentence. And you'll be reading this and think to yourself, oh boy, I need to memorize these terms, and then I need to memorize which ones are future less vivid and which ones are contrary to fact present, and you'll have a conniption trying to figure this out. And it's all unnecessary. You don't need it at all. And it's wrong, because when they try to do this, they'll present translations that are objectively wrong losing the sense of the subjunctive verbs. So forget all this stuff and instead just follow your standard SHWCM rules for subjunctives and indicative rules for indicatives. It's so easy. Now it's not going to always be perfect because sometimes the sense will be a little bit un-Englishy, but you can figure it out. You might have to try a different SHWC or M1 to make it really work and sound good. Or you could just imagine your timeline and think of it in Latin, not trying to translate it. And that would be the best way to go. All right, so guidelines for interpreting. If you have two subjunctive clauses, then favor an SHW pattern. If shall, then will. If shall have, then will have. If should, then would. If should have, then would have. You can also occasionally have like the VE and then no VE, like if should have, then would. That'll work too. Okay, a second guideline. If the verb is subjunctive, then imagine it in theory, in principle, less vividly than you would a real event. And lastly, there's this special rule that you may have heard before. After C, Nisi, Num, and Ne, all the alleys fall away. So if you run into something like this in a sentence, and you're trying to translate it, and it's something like if what said, or if said what, and it doesn't make sense, remember this rule. After C, Nisi, Num, and Ne, all the alleys fall away. So there's probably a hidden alley in there. And so really now, suddenly it makes sense. Aliquid means anything. So if anything he said. Oh, bingo, we've got it. So remember these three rules. Should, would, when you have two subjunctives, vagueness, and alice slipping in after the conjunction. So, here's some examples of other textbooks messing it up, but we'll also get some experience going through these. If he were present, it would be well, they say. No, don't translate it like an indicative, it's a subjunctive. If he should be present, it would be well. And here you've satisfied your SHW rule because it had two subjunctives. If hulk dicas creditor, they'll say, if anyone ever says this, it is always believed. Well, why do you need to slip in ever and always? If you just said it like it should be, it would work. If anyone may say this, he is believed. See how this is conveying a principle in theory? Okay, now then you don't need ever and always. See, Marcus Iulium Amet, Ea M Amet, 
two subjunctives, probably a SHW role. But they'll say, if Marcus should someday can't love Julia, she would love him. I'm sorry, just keep it, if Marcus shall love Julia, she will love him. Both present looking forward subjunctives. The same book says, if Marcus amaret Julia, she amaret am. And they'll translate this as, if Marcus loved Julia, they, they claim this is an imperfect subjunctive, but they don't even do it like a was blanking. But this is obviously not as good as, if Marcus should love Julia, she would love him. Now, notice this. They translated both of these as should love him, even though one was a present forward-looking and the other was a past forward-looking. So obviously they lost meaning using the common way of translating subjunctives. Don't do that. Do our way, the way of translating with SHWCM, and avoid the mess. All right, so frequently used sequences. So these are sequences of if-thens that you'll often run into. Okay, so this one is on the timeline, so imagine that these are indicatives. If will, then will. So too, this is also indicatives. If will of, then will. That's called the future perfect, which you'll learn in stage 30. It's a subset of the greater present backward-looking subjunctive. But, okay, now this is a not on the timeline, so this is subjunctives. If shall, will is very common. If should, would is very common. If blanked, then something blanked. This pattern of two indicatives is common. If should have, would have, that's very common. Lastly, if should have, then would, that's common. All right, so you see here that conditional clauses can really be pretty much anywhere. The key is not to remember where they occur in the timeline. The key is just to read them in order on the page as what they literally say. So let's see how well you remembered those rules that I gave to you. So try these questions here. On this slide, you're attempting to identify errors in subjunctives. So like in this one, there is a problem with it. It's written wrongly. And I want you to tell me what's wrong with it. If you need the English, there it is for you. But it should be written differently. And go through this slide. And then after you're done with it, then try the next two slides as well, in which you are going to actually write subjunctives. And then start the video again when you're ready to go on to the next slide. Okay, so now we're going to get into actually writing subjunctives. And if you forget a word, they're all right here on this slide, so feel free to always come back to this if you forget a word. Okay, so write these conditional statements in Latin. If you may have an illness, don't kiss me. As you do this, pay attention to what tense every verb is, and write it as that tense. So, may have is going to be present, future looking, forward looking subjunctive. Don't kiss me is a command form, so write it as a command form. If you will have caught sight of Rome, you will indeed be silent. Will have is present backward looking, or if you're in stage 30, that's also the future perfect. And will is future, so write it like that. And you can try the rest of these Stop the video and then start it again when you're ready to see the answers. Okay, so hopefully you can make out the different choices here, like osculearis or osculamini, um, or tum or tunc, and so on and so forth. All right, so that's it. We have gone through seven different kinds of subjunctive clauses. And that is going to be 99% of every subjunctive that you'll ever see in any work in Latin. So good luck and enjoy it and start reading these subjunctive clauses like an expert. Walete!